on December 24th, 2002, shortly after 5.15 p.m., I received a phone call and heard the devastating words that forever changed my life. Lacey's missing. I knew in my heart that something terrible had happened to my daughter and my grandson. My world collapsed around me. Of the more than 16,000 homicides that year 2002, none captivates the nation like the outrageous murder of Sharon Roach's pregnant daughter, Lacey Peterson. On this Fox News special report, we test the evidence that led to Scott Peterson's conviction, meet his motive, review his death sentence, and expose the condemned man's privileged life in San Quentin Prison. Here at the Hall of Justice in San Mateo County, California, Scott Peterson was sentenced almost exactly 10 years ago to die by lethal injection after being convicted for the murders of his wife, Lacey, and their unborn child, Connor. Now on death row, Scott joins 725 other condemned inmates, all no doubt comforted by the fact that California has not actually executed anybody since 2006. Still, his lawyers are using this time to appeal his death sentence, saying essentially that Scott could not have killed Connor because the child had not yet been born. Tonight on this special report, we'll test the constitutionality of that controversial claim and probe whether the jury did the right thing when they sentenced to death the young fertilizer salesman whose alibi stunk worse than the product he sold. Lacey meant the world to me. She was my only daughter. She was my best friend. <laughs> Christmas Eve 2002. 27-year-old Lacey is missing from her suburban home in Medicine. Where's her husband? The charming, well-regarded 30-year-old Scott is looking for big fish in a small boat. Or so he tells lead detective Al Broschini. Scott said he was fishing, but he didn't know what he was fishing for. He was talking to a few fishermen at the time. He didn't know what kind of bait he was using. He had washed his clothes. Scott's no fisherman. At the time his wife disappears, her family thinks Scott is at the country club golfing. Hi, can I help you? Yes. Um, my son-in-law called. He's been playing golf this mm -hmm. morning mm -hmm. at 9.30. My daughter's been missing since this morning. She's eight months pregnant. Lacey's family didn't even know he owned a boat, which he purchased for $1,400 in cash, according to Detective John Bueller. He'd gone fishing. She was there at the house. He returned, and she was gone. All he could say is she was there when he left. He got home. She wasn't there. Detective, in my experience, Whenever a spouse is killed, particularly a wife, I always initially suspect the husband. At what point did Scott Peterson go from being a victim, or the bereaved uh, husband of the victim, to being a suspect in this case? Well, Geraldo, almost immediately. When he came home from fishing, he took all his clothes off and put them in the washing machine and started the, the wash cycle. He ate some frozen, or some cold pizza. He took a shower. He, you know, drank some milk, he checked his email, and then he called Sharon. There are these questions that continue to swirl around your son-in-law, you know, and his alibi. Is it safe to assume that, I don't know, you have questions as well? No, I've spoken to Scott many times. Yeah, I mean, he, Scott is such a loving person to Lacey. If, if, if you knew Scott, you wouldn't have any doubt. There's plenty of doubt in my mind at the time covering the investigation. Scott's alibi seems implausible. After telling everyone that he's gone golfing, why does he even admit that he was fishing so far from Modesto at the Berkeley Marina on San Francisco Bay? 90 miles from Berkeley to Modesto, with lots of rivers and lakes in between. But it's not unheard of for avid fishermen to make that drive. It was sturgeon season after all. And he does have some proof that he was here but his alibi is far from airtight. While he does have a receipt, a timestamp receipt, that he paid the launch fee for his boat, skeptics ask whether or not he paid the five bucks just to buy himself an alibi. Our thought was that it was possible he was worried that he was discovered and seen there, and that's the reason that he possibly changed his motive, or his, his alibi from golfing to going fishing that day. Once committed to his fishing alibi, Scott tries to perfect it with a series of phone calls on the long drive home. One call to Lacey. He was showered in I love yous and things like that. Seemed like the ideal thing for a husband to say to a wife. But when they'd been married for five years, 
got a baby on the way. Maybe it was sincere, but it just didn't seem like it to us. It, 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 it seemed like a message that you would leave for somebody to take the focus off of you. Close friends Greg and Kristen Reed tell brother Craig Rivera they also received calls from Scott the day Lacey goes missing. There were multiple messages from a frantic Scott. Uh, have you seen Lacey? Do you know where Lacey's at? And these are over a period of probably about two and a half hours. Um, did Kristen talk to her? Did Kristen talk to her today? Uh, one thing that I pointed out to the authorities from the messages, it took them a long time to come listen to them, is that it was very clear there was noise, tire noise, road noise. He was driving every time he had called. So he was on the road when he was calling you? Right. Probably driving back from Berkeley Marina. That appeared to be what was going on. With Scott locked into his fishing element, the experienced detectives find something disturbing in his boat. Evidence of five homemade cement anchors, of which only one remains. There were at least five rings, perfectly round rings on that trailer with cement around them, as if there was a bucket. We only found one anchor. If you make five anchors and you only can find one, and when the body is recovered right close to where he's told me he was fishing, and it's recovered, with no head and no hands and no feet, I can guess they might have been on the body when it went, went in the water. The day after Christmas 2002, as the community rallies around Scott, the family offers a cash reward, pleading for Lacey's safe return. You know, we want to know where she is. We want to know that she's safe and we want her to come home to us. When I met him, he's, he's kind of being a matter of fact, nonchalant, no urgency in his voice. There was urgency in the neighborhood. Scott stands on the sidelines as the search widens, and cops grow ever more wary. On the 26th, we went over to his house with a search warrant because we were going to process the house as a crime scene. We didn't tell him that's what we were doing, but certainly when we go over there, we're going to ask for permission to do that, which we always do on a search warrant. Well, Scott wouldn't give us permission to search his house. Scott looks at me and he says, Al, where's the trust? That's what he says to me. I mean... And I said, Scott, where's the trust? We're trying to find your wife. These are the things that were strange about him where we didn't see it with other family members and friends. Everybody else was cooperative to a fault, except Scott. As the investigation proceeds, Scott takes a special interest in the search around Berkeley Marina. He's just coming back, you know, to the scene of the crime, as far as I'm concerned, and checking it out and making sure we're not finding something, and then he's leaving. There was one time when there was a false alert where they had, uh, the, the searchers had, had found something and the, the buzz was that it was possibly the body, but it, of course it turned out to be an anchor. There was a phone call that was made to Scott, of course it went over to his voicemail because he screened his calls, and when he was told that it wasn't Lacey, that it was just an anchor, we could hear him on the tape do a subdued whistle, kind of like... Hi Scott, this is Mom, it's about quarter to one. Just wanted to know, I just got a call from Ron, Ron Cloward, he's at Marina, and it was a boat anchor. Of course, we knew it wasn't Lacey, but I just wanted you to know. Um. She's like, Whew. Now, if that, I, you know, that speaks, he was so relieved that it wasn't her, because he, I don't know, I believe he knew, he knew we were looking in the right place. 